Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Arthur Imoru. Today we are going to talk about the challenges of spinal anesthesia. We are going to talk about failed spinal anesthesia. This talk is sponsored by Troika, the, the, the manufacturers of Bupi Troy Heavy, the spinal anesthetic drug that is commonly used here in Uganda. Now, what is a failed spinal anesthetic? A failed spinal anesthetic is uh, any spinal anesthetic that has been attempted but does not meet satisfactory conditions to proceed with the surgery. This can range from the block completely failing or to having a patchy block where you don't have adequate height, adequate depth, or even adequate duration of the spinal anesthetic. The, this, in this talk, we shall talk about, uh, we shall look at the literature on failed spinal anesthesia, look at some of the factors that affect spinal anesthesia, look at Bupi Troy uh, Heavy, that's manufactured by Troika, and that will be it. The rate and the incidence of failed spinal anesthesia ranges from 1% in very experienced hands to 17% that has been quoted from American teaching hospitals. Uh, this range is also wide and it varies in different parts of the world. There is no clear pattern. Um, so you find in a di different parts of the world, the range at some point is really high, some point is really low without following a clear pattern. If you look at the incidences of failed spinal anesthesia in different parts of the world, uh, you will find that many times we anesthesia providers are quick to blame the spinal anesthetic, the drug that we are using. But there are many other factors that cause a failed spinal anesthetic. Take, for example, these three cases in Singapore uh, where there was a failed spinal anesthetic. When the drug was analyzed, it was found to be effective and the product was not recalled, meaning that the cause of the failed spinal anesthetic was not the drug, it was really the technique that the doctors uh, maybe had not mastered at some point. Uh, take also a similar situation in the UK. Uh, there were these five cases of failed spinal anesthesia and the drug again was found not to be the one with the problem because it wasn't recalled, it was tested, it was working quite well. So meaning that again, that the cause was something else. Uh, again, a similar situation in the UK, where there are these cases of uh, failed spinal anesthesia, the drug was found to be perfectly fine. Also these cases in, the, in New York, in the USA, in these 11 cases of failed spinal anesthesia are found in a span of uh, uh, six months, the drug was still found to be perfectly fine. Also take these cases, uh, in uh, Toronto, Canada, the drug was still found to be perfectly fine. So, um, in a, around the world, you will find that uh, as much as we anesthesia providers like to blame the spinal anesthetic, there are many other causes of failed spinal anesthesia. And those causes uh, can be classified into four categories. One, the characteristics of the injected solution, the clinical technique, the patient characteristics and the characteristics of the spinal fluid. If we look at the characteristics of the injected solution, it's important to know the type of drug that you're using, what's its concentration, what's its dose, what's its volume, and also to be aware of the temperature at which you're storing it. For the, we are all aware that the higher the dose or the concentration, the denser the block will be, and the higher the volume, the higher the spread will be. Uh, for example, on the Ugandan market, we have some drugs that are 0.75%, others are 0.5%. Uh, so you will find uh, if you have the, the higher concentration one, the block will be denser, uh, the, but if the volume is low, the spread is not as good. Um, but also, if the drug is kept in a really cold uh, area, the, the, start, the spread will not be as good because it is at a much lower temperature compared to the body, uh, or it may not be as quick. Uh, so it's important for the drug to be at least near the temperature of the, the body. So again, looking at uh, the baricity of the solutions or the local anesthetic, 
we know that the hyperbaric solutions will go to the most dependent area, the hyperbaric solutions will go to the least dependent area, and the isobaric solution unit will remain where they are injected. It's important to be aware of the drug that you're injecting uh, so that you can predict how it is going to spread. For example, if you're using a hyperbaric solution and your patient stays seated for quite a long time, you will end up with a saddle block and some parts of your of the abdomen of the patient may not be covered. Uh, so it's important to know uh, the kind of drug that you're using. So the other thing is about the clinical technique. In the clinical technique, we've already talked about the effect of the baricity of the solution. We know if you put your patient in a head down position and you're given a hyperbaric solution, uh, the drug will go towards the most dependent part in the hyperbaric, the least dependent part in isobaric, it will stay in the same area. It is the same situation when you do head up and then it's the same situation when you do lateral. Hyperbaric solution goes to the most dependent area, hyperbaric goes to the least dependent area, and isobaric stays in the area of injection. The other thing that affects uh, our spinal anesthetics is the level of injection. Uh, many times, if we put the, the spinal anesthetic at L2 or L3, you will find that the drug will have a preferentially cranial spread. Uh, as opposed to if you put it at L4, L5. These diagrams illustrate that uh, really well. For example, if you put the drug in uh, L2, L3, you have, a, pro you have a, a much better cranial spread, which covers the, which covers the nerves that supply the abdominal dermatomes, uh, compared to if you put it at L4, L5. Of course, uh, there are maneuvers that you can do if you've placed your drug at L4, L5, there are maneuvers that you can do to improve the spread of the drug so that it, it goes towards uh, the cranial, the, it spreads cranially towards the dermatomes uh, that, are, that are important for the surgery that you're going to do. Uh, but if you give, if for example, think about in our pregnant patients, especially African patients, uh, you find there's an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. So, this challenge is even more pronounced in pregnant, uh, in pregnant uh, patients uh, because of that exaggerated lumbar lordosis. So you find if you place it at L4, L5, there's a lot more caudal spread compared to if you place it at uh, L2, L3, or L3, L4. But again, there are maneuvers that can be, that you can do to improve the spread cranially, the Vasalva maneuver, uh, flipping the bed, doing a trend in back position can improve your spread, uh, which every anesthesia provider should be familiar with. Now, the type of spinal needles that we use also affects the, the quality of our spinal anesthetic. Uh, there are generally there are three types of spinal needles that are available, the Quinky, Whitaker, and the Sprout. The challenge comes a lot when you're using the Sprout. Uh, because um, when the, the sports needle has, when using the sports needle and you have CSF backflow, sometimes there may be a dural flap that has sat, that has sat in, the, in the opening of the needle, such that when you aspirate that initial aspiration, you, still, you will see CSF, yes, but as you're pushing in the drug, that flap uh, closes off the subarachnoid space such that the drug enters into the epidural or subdural space, uh, hence giving you a patchy block and uh, getting a failed spine. A technique to avoid this is to, once using for the Sprout or the Whitaker, once you see CSF, you try to advance at least one or two millimeters in so that the opening of the needle is completely in the subarachnoid space to avoid getting this uh, flap of the dura effect that gives a, a failed spine. Now, in among the patient characteristics that affects our spinal anesthetics, um, they range from age to many other characteristics that are different as people are different. We all know that the, the younger people, uh, a 10 year old is not the same as a 20 year old they will have a different length of spine, they will have a different uh, volume of CSF, and all those things affect the, 
the rate and the spread of uh, the local anesthetic in the CSA. Uh, when you think about height, for example, some people assume that if you have a shorter patient, you should use a smaller dose of local anesthetic. But that is actually not true because uh, generally speaking, if you find uh, in adults, the taller people are not tall because of a longer back. They are tall because of longer legs. So the spine length is generally within the same range. So you don't have to adjust the dose. Um, in my own practice, unless someone is in extremes of height, uh, like maybe a pygmy compared to uh, an NBA player, but in the general population, if a person is five five, uh, if a person is five feet, usually they'll need the same dose of local anesthetic with a person who is maybe six two. So that the height uh, should not uh, matter because there is spine length is generally the same. Weight has not been to have uh, a specific uh, any particular uh, influence as far as spinal anesthesia is concerned. Uh, when it comes to height, when it comes to sex, which has been found that males have a higher CSF density than females, and thereby it limits the cephalic spread of the local anesthetic. For patients who have increased intra-abdominal pressure, there is engorgement of the epidural veins, uh, which causes a decrease in CSF volume, resulting in a higher block. Uh, this is commonly seen in pregnant people or in obese people. Uh, so. Uh, the other thing is also in the spinal anatomy. Some patients may have abnormalities in the spine, which uh, affect the spread of your local anesthetic and in, uh, may give you a failed spine. I've already mentioned how in pregnancy, in pregnancy, you would need to use uh, a reduced dose of a local anesthetic one because there is engorgement of those epidural veins and a decrease in CSF uh, volume. And also, pregnant patients have an increased. Uh, sensitivity to local anesthetics so that those you use is much less uh, than in their non-pregnant state. When you have patients who are drug addicts, uh, their sensation of pain has been altered because of the drug uh, abuse. So sometimes you may get increased incidences of failure in such patients. Then in the rare circumstances, you may find patients who have genetic uh, resistance to local anesthetic, where they have genetic polymorphism in sodium in the sodium channels of the nerves. Um, so the other factors that affect um, spinal anesthetics uh, are the characteristics of the spinal fluid. We've already mentioned the CSF volume. If the volume is less, the spread is, uh, is more. And if the volume is dense, the, the spread is also uh, is less. So now looking at Bupitroy Heavy. Bupitroy is uh, manufactured by Troika. It comes in a, a four mil ampule. It's 0.5%, meaning five milligrams per mil. And it has dextrose in it that gives it the hyperbaricity. And it has no preservatives. Uh, when it, it's manufactured a fully automated hands-free line with dual sterilization. What that means uh, is that it is sterilized uh, twice. The drug itself is sterilized within the ampule, but then also the ampule in the blister pack is sterilized. That way, when you're preparing your, uh, your pack or your sterile area where you're, where you're placing your syringes or needles, you can open the blister pack and place the ampule onto, and also open the ampule onto that sterile pack because it is double sterilized. That way the anesthesia provider can break the drug for himself and doesn't have to be another person uh, who is maybe unscrubbed, uh, breaking the drug and then giving the anesthesia provider to a spirit. So yeah, you can open the ampule onto the sterile pack and, and the anesthesia provider breaks it uh, himself. It also has a one point cut, which makes it easy to break. This one point cut makes it so easy to break that you don't have to use cotton, gauze or any papers you can just you always break away from the blue from the blue from the blue dot it is really easy because of that one point cut you're not at risk of getting you won't get cut i've broken these myself many times i've never had a cut with uh, breaking these bopitroy heavy ampules 
So Bupitrol Heavy is crafted with utmost care and it's a very good drug for our spinal anesthetics. Uh, you, so you can feel free to conduct Troika pharmaceuticals if you want any. Uh, in summary, the, the effect of local anesthesia in spinal, uh, in spinal anesthesia is dependent on many factors. As much as we like to blame the drug, uh, many times it is not the drug. The factors are really many, a lot more actually than the ones that are covered in this talk. And then failed spinal anesthesia has a wide range of incidents, uh, ranging from 1% to 17%. And then bupitrol heavy is a very good drug for your spinal anesthetics. It's important for anesthesia providers to meet and share skills to improve their spinal anesthesia techniques so that your failed spinal anesthesia rate can keep going down and down and down, approaching towards zero. Yesterday, we had uh, a, a, a session, uh, a practical session with uh, Traker Pharmaceuticals where we exchanged uh, techniques and skills among different anesthesia providers on on the spinal anesthetic skills. And um, I believe all the people who attended benefited a lot from this and are going to become much better at spinal anesthesia and have fewer cases of failed spinal anesthesia. Thank you for listening to me.